All right. Time now. Let's move on to the interview section. Well, hello. As promised, we're now going to be speaking with uh, Houston Nutt, uh, former, uh, actually played quarterback at uh, at Arkansas, head coach there at Arkansas, head coach at Ole Miss. Uh, knows the SEC like the back of his hand, and uh, one of the great guys in college football. Houston, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Randy. Nah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. This is the best time of the year, isn't it? Yeah, no doubt about it. I, when you look at sort of the way things came out this year in the SEC, I guess impression one may be no real surprise when you look at the top, but overall, what did you think of this season? Yeah, you know, the first thing, Randy, I, I just I want to go back to Alabama. We all expect Alabama to be good, but I, I never expected the, the offense to, to me, just kind of separate themselves with uh, Tua Tunga Valoa. Uh, so explosive to be able to score so fast, and the way they, the way the offense, offense executed, you know, it's much much different than years past. You know, years past we, you knew there's going to be a good running game, you knew there's going to be good defense, good special teams, well coached. We get all that, but man, uh, the way they play offense now to me is just at a different level. The receivers create so much separation, unbelievable, and then. Um, just looking at everything on the whole, uh, Georgia, you know, outstanding. Uh, Jake Fromm and the group, uh, uh, to me, they kept kept getting better, very athletic. Um, uh, defensively, they've probably been better in years past, but they seem like some of the younger guys are coming on. And you gotta you got to give hats off to Kentucky. Kentucky did a really good job. Co- Coach Stoops um, just really hung in there and uh, did a good job the last few years of recruiting Benny Snell. And then, really, when you look at Josh Allen and the defense, really done a great job of recruiting. They're athletic, and they're sitting there at number two behind Georgia. Uh, just a just a really good year. And then uh, on the western side, it's always been very very tough. But um, LSU, uh, I thought Joe Burrow uh, was a guy that uh, kind of brought things together. Make you know, not great, not great stats. N- probably not the big time. Uh, guy that you're looking for, but in years past, if you put Joe Burrow, I, I really love some of the decisions that he made and the way he handled their offense, the way that he took care of the ball uh, most of the year was just uh, uh, really good. So um, I, I just, um, you know, SEC is, is yeah, as we all know, always a very physical, tough league, but uh, usually the same same people at the front right now, and uh, we look for Florida and look for Tennessee to start making moves because Florida, of course, they won. You look up, and they won nine games this year, and uh, Coach Mullen has them going in the right direction. South Carolina got better, and and I, I, I keep I keep looking for Tennessee to get better. I know they're disappointed they didn't get to a bowl game. Yeah, uh, Vanderbilt beats them, so yeah, for the third uh, for the third year in a row. Yeah, that that just doesn't seem possible, does wow. it? Wow. <laughs> wow. Hey, and you're a guy, you've had a lot of experience in overtime games. Um, what would you think of that A&M LSU game the other night? I mean, 74-72. You talked about Joe Burrow and, and LSU. I mean, he he yeah. he scores 72 and loses? Uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, I had a lot of uh, former players that were texting me during that time saying, they're, they're going to get our record. They're going to get our record. And uh, it, that was unbelievable uh the, the game just kept going back and forth uh you know hitting the two-point plays and and uh just uh, really everybody just fighting their guts out uh, uh something else to look up there and see the score 70 something points the most ever unbelievable hey Houston you're a coach in those situations give fans a little bit of a picture um into that with those decisions that happen I mean no staff on this earth has I don't know what eight different plays for two point plays that that just isn't realistic nobody goes in with that kind of a arsenal where do those two pl- two point plays come from do they come nowadays out of your normal spread do they come out of your short yardage packages I mean where do they come from that that's a great question because during the week on Thursday, you have one, 
maybe two two-point plays that you always work on, always work on. Then all of a sudden you get to a game like that and – you're going through and you look up, uh, it's the third overtime. Oh, it's the fourth overtime. It's the fifth overtime. So now you go back to what gives you, what has helped you the most throughout the game, uh, whether it be in short yardage or your three to five, your third down package or whatever it is at that three yard line, you feel like can cross that last white line. What's given you the most success. Um, and it looks like to me, uh, they put the, the ball in the hands of their quarterback. When you look at, some of the plays that they doubt. I'm always curious, just the question you ask about what happens during this time. Well, you, you hadn't practiced on seven overtimes. Uh, you practice on a, on a couple of two-point plays at the most. And so now you lean on what gives us the best chance. Which play have we been running uh, or what we've run in the maybe last week that's given us the best, best chance to execute and score? And that's what you rely on. And you just you, you turn it loose right there, and it's something. If you notice, uh, Jimbo Fisher says, "Hey, I didn't I didn't realize what overtime it is." And that's the thing you get lost in it. You're not keeping up with. Okay, this is number three. This is number four. This is number five. Right. You you realize when it's number three when you got to start going for two. Right. And then you start. You just you're just into the game. You're into the next play. Hey, yeah. Speaking of sort of offenses and, and plays. I wanted to see if you could explain to fans. We've seen so many, especially last weekend, and I'm sure in the conference championships, we're going to see it again. Everybody's using so much of these spread offenses. And we all love what they look like, and we love the scoring. But from a defensive standpoint, how much stress is put on these defenses when you see an offense, uh, either when they come out, just spread all over the, all over the field, or when they'll come out maybe in 12 formation and they'll have a tight end and an H-back, and then they'll take the H-back and they'll put him in the slot. Then they'll take the tight end and they'll move him back and maybe motion him outside. Suddenly, the defense has to defend the entire field, and people wonder why receivers come just slap wide open when you have any kind of mental bust. I mean, defensively, how do you really prepare for that? You know, Randy, if if you did a study, especially the last five years, uh, the biggest change is you look up in the the scoreboard. I mean, the scoreboard is just these the offenses are scoring so many points, so many points, and they got you from sideline to sideline. And one of the biggest things that that that's happening, as you know, is the RPO, which is the run pass option, where linemen it looks as though it's run. They're coming off. It could be a handoff and they're in run action form. And then all of a sudden backers come up to tackle the running back thinking it's a run. And then there's a wide open window that they're throwing slants behind um, right where the linebacker vacated. And so it's just unbelievable. When you add that to what you're talking about with movement, motions, tight ends, moving out, motioning inside, moving it outside. And then, uh, now it, it, there's a lot of adjustments and thinking, and then you're doing a lot of tackling in space, especially with up tempo, and so it's a whole different world now. And you know, just watching the um, the Oklahoma game, mm-hmm. uh, West Virginia. I mean, it just it is almost like you might as well take the pads off. It's just it's offense. It, the offense is going up and down the field over 500 and something yards apiece, and you, you, you're just seeing people that are in space and these athletes that are just, they're beating them one-on-one. It goes back to what you're saying. You got movement, motions. Now let's, let's make sure we got to cover from sideline to sideline. So much stress on the defense that um, it, just, it just seems like uh, they're behind right now. Now, I will say this. When you go watch Alabama practice and you watch Clemson practice, I've, I've seen a couple of these things where, they're they're a little bit more physical during the, you know, the August, September, October months, and um, it, it looks like to me those defenses continue to get better, and you don't see as many explosive plays on on teams like that. Did did you see a few dents in the armor this weekend? Cut last weekend with the, the amount of scoring against, for instance, the big plays that South Carolina had against Clemson. The fact that the game's been so tight the last couple of weeks 
with Alabama? Or do you see things there that, that give people a little bit of hope? I know Michigan was disappointing uh, with what they did against Ohio State, but they still scored a decent amount of points right. in, in that loss. Is there still hope there that some of these big dogs aren't quite as good as we think and that in this championship week we could see even more turmoil? I, I think so, Randy, and I think as teams start preparing for one another, that's one of the things they'll point to is, okay, wait a minute, South Carolina had this explosive play, had this many uh, uh, first downs, this many explosive big plays at certain times, and they'll study that very hard and think, hey, we we have a chance to put uh, one or two of our athletes in, in this particular situation. So there is hope. There's definitely hope. Uh, it, it comes down. You don't have to be better than them 12 weeks. You got to be better than that team for 60 minutes. And so uh, looking forward to it. This is what makes this part of the year so much fun. Hey, I wanted to ask you something. And I, and I ask you this as a friend, because I know you, you know about this intimately. But last week on the podcast, I did a little commentary about this being that time of the year when when coaches are being relieved of duty or, or fired or whatever. And that people don't understand the sort of cascading effect and how wide that net goes when a coach is let go. Everyone always thinks, oh, well, the coach is, coach is fired. That's just the coach. Well, that doesn't include his staff. doesn't include how many people in that building are affected when that happens and how many families are affected when that happens. Well, Randy, that's so true. Uh, you know, you, you, there's so much responsibility from that head coach when when you talk about, you know, your 10 coaches, you talk about trainers, you're talking about weight, uh, strength coaches, grad assistants. And um, now you're talking about their wives. You're talking about their children. And uh, it, it's a it's a massive, massive deal. And uh, um, I can tell you, it, it, it's it's so hard, and especially for the wives, the wives are the ones that uh, they're usually always the ones that have to do the packing up, the selling of the home. The, the husband's trying to get to the next place, get to the next job. And uh, here, here we go. I mean, you're talking about so many uh, lives that are changed and so many effects that they, that happens in, in the stress of it. You know, the stress of when you get fired, when you hear those words, hey, you're fired, um, you know, it's what next? You know, that, that husband... And that coach is trying to put groceries on the table, and where are we going next? And the wife and the children has to the, – the wife is almost like a head coach of taking care of the children, getting them to school, and trying to put a smile on your face, and uh, you go about business. But you're, you're exactly right. It, it's, a, it's a massive, massive deal, and uh, it's not easy. How, how do you think coaches these days with the whole social media atmosphere that we have as a country that's so negative – um, how do you insulate them or can you insulate much less your family, but also your players from that kind of stuff? Yeah. You know, it's it start with the family. I, I, I think that's where the, the coach, it's so important that the, the wife is so strong because you know, the, the coach, we can go in a meeting room and close the door and, and really try to keep the noise to, to a, you know, a certain level where the wife has to go to the grocery store. The wife has to take the kids to the school, has to take them to the soccer game or basketball game or football game. And, and, and there's always the whispers. And what's tough is, you know, sometimes even in, in grade school, your kids, uh, some of the kids can be very, very cruel. And so it, 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 there's a lot of teaching that goes on there. And it, it starts to me with the wife has to be so strong and um, you keep that family uh, very tight. And uh, same way with the football team. And uh, when, you, when you're in that meeting room, when things aren't going well, you close that door and say, hey, nobody loves you right now but your, <clears throat> but your mama and us. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so it's important that you stay together as a team because you know because of so much media, the blogs and, and all the, uh, the, the, the Twitter world, uh, it, you know, it can be a negative, negative world. And so, and also on the flip side, when things are going good, you want to be careful there too, because you get too many pats on the back. So it, it's a balancing act. And, and again, it's not easy, but it's important to keep that team together and, and keep a, a senior group who takes owner of your ownership of the team is, is so important for them to lead. You know, along those lines, any of the recent 
firings catch you catch you by surprise or any of those that maybe didn't happen for instance a clay helton at usc any of those sort of surprise you well you know you know i'm like everybody you sit there and you hear rumors and rumors of and you're thinking usc's next and and uh you know I, i give i give kudos to for the athletic director saying hey he's he's my coach and staying with him and you know, let's go back to Mark Stoops. You know, you heard rumblings about, you know, a couple That's years true. ago. and They hung in there with him and look look at his program. So, you know, I, I, there's nothing to me like I have a lot of respect for a team of an athletic director that uh, can handle the noise, the outside noise, especially when it gets loud and you got banners flying, let's get rid of the coach, and, and he hangs in there. I got a lot of respect for, for guys that have backbone like that. But uh, – I always expect this time of year, you know, I always expect uh, there'll be some coaches that, uh, you know, that are going to be let go. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Hey, Houston, I'm looking forward to working together this weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun and can't wait to see these championship games. Can't wait. Can't wait. All right, Houston. Thank you so much.